Welcome to the 2013-2014 Lectures in Catholic Experience. My name is Christina Vanine. I'm Associate Pro Professor in the Department of Religious Studies and Director of the Master of Catholic Thought Program here at St. Jerome's University, and I'm coordinating this year's lecture series. Before we get started, okay, I will not drop my voice, and Tate will make sure it's a sound. Is that better? Before we start this evening, would you please check in whatever bags and purses and backpacks and whatever you might have with you and make sure that all your electronic devices are turned off. There we go. To begin our event this evening, I would like to ask Dr. Catherine Bergman, President of St. Jerome's University, to come forward and offer some words of welcome to you on behalf of the University. Good evening. It is a real pleasure to welcome you to St. Jerome's University this evening for our first lecture in Catholic experience of the 2013-2014 academic year. At SJU, we are continuing to grow from those early beginnings in 1865, the almost 150-year-old vision of our founding fathers, the Congregation of the Resurrection. We have not wavered from the distinctive educational spirit and vision of our founding fathers of developing the whole person, intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually. Today, we are a vibrant and diverse, inclusive community that brings together academics, faith, and student life. At SJU, we encourage our students to broaden their horizons, to see the world from many different perspectives, to cultivate their imagination, and to empathize with the experiences, hopes, and dreams of other people. We hope to foster in them the ability to see what is, to advocate for the common good, the vision to see what might be, and the courage to stand up for what is just. We promote an intellectual experience where acquired wisdom resides not only in reasoning and intellect, but in the depth of our whole being, heart and soul, so that in this way, we can truly work together for the resurrection of society, bringing God's life and love to all. Thank you again for joining us this evening. If this is your first time attending a lecture, we hope that you will consider attending other events and lectures. For our loyal supporters, welcome back. I hope you all had a really nice summer. We thank you for your ongoing commitment and support of SJU and look forward to seeing you at our other lectures and events. Thank you, Catherine. This past July, Pope Francis joined thousands of young people in World Youth Day celebrations in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. In his major speech there, Pope Francis said, the Brazilian people, particularly the humblest among you, can offer the world a valuable lesson in solidarity, a word that is too often forgotten or silenced because it's uncomfortable. No one can remain insensitive to the inequalities that persist in the world. Everybody, according to his or her particular opportunities and responsibilities, should be able to make a personal contribution to putting an end to so many social injustices. The culture of selfishness and individualism that often prevails in our society is not what builds up. It is instead the culture of solidarity that does so, seeing others not as rivals or statistics, but as our brothers and sisters. This urgent call to rethink solidarity and make it a core value throughout the world re requires of us a reconsideration of our global economic system to ensure the dignity of all persons and the well-being of the whole of creation. Such reflection on the meaning of solidarity has to be done through collaboration, cooperation, and dialogue. In other words, 
we must pursue the common good together. And so tonight we have with us Dr. John Stapleton to help us think about the role that Catholic education may have or should have in the pursuit of the common good. Born and raised in Newfoundland and Labrador and currently a professor in the Faculty of Education at the University of Manitoba, Dr. Stapleton has been active in Catholic and public education at both the school and university levels for the past five decades. He received a Bachelor of Science degree from Iona College in New York, an MTS degree from the Catholic University of America, and MA and PhD degrees from the University of Toronto. And in 2010, Dr. Stapleton was awarded an honorary degree in Sacred Letters from Regis College in Toronto. He's been a school teacher in Ontario, British Columbia, and Newfoundland and Labrador. And he's been a faculty member at Memorial University, Western University, and Lakehead University. Dr. Stapleton has served as Dean of Education at Lakehead University as well as the University of Manitoba. He served as Rector of St. Paul's College in Winnipeg, as Principal at St. Mark's College at the University of British Columbia, and as President of Corpus Christi College in Vancouver. Along with his extensive teaching and administrative experience, Dr. Stapleton is the author of many academic papers and reports on educational leadership and Catholic education. His present research is focused on the current state and the future directions of Catholic higher education in Canada. And so we are very pleased that he can be with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Stapleton to speak to us on the theme, The Common Good, Does Catholic Education Have a Role? I get tired listening to how long I've been working in, in, the, in the system, which reminds me that I had a, a letter uh, this spring from a young man, well, not a young man anymore. Can you hear me in the back okay? We, we, we okay? All right. And he's just retiring as a social worker. And he wrote to me and said, well, do you remember back in 1963, 64, when you were my homeroom teacher in grade nine? <laughs> and he had one or two nice things to say. And then he said, and you cut me from the basketball team the junior boy, it's amazing the stuff we long remember all our lives is, uh, is, uh, is, th is that kind of stuff. Thank you, Christine, for the nice words. Uh, the, um, and, and thank you, Catherine, for uh, giving me the chance to be with the community today. I have a very high, okay, I have a very high regard for St. Jerome's. I think it's been one of the leaders in Canadian Catholic higher education over the, over the years. And, uh, and so it's been a great pleasure to be with the community today to talk about uh, about Catholic education. Um, I, I want to I start this thing as an introductory comment by saying I often use my son, my oldest boy, for comments about what I'm going to talk about. One time I had to give a talk about the, uh, the characteristics of, of good Catholic schools. So I said to Rob, what do you think? He was in junior high at the time. What do you think makes for a good school? And he thought about it a little bit and he said, well, first of all, it had to have a 7-Eleven store next door. That, that was the uh, number one thing. And then he said, it can't have too many kids who wear leather jackets. And lastly, it had to have a principal who yelled a lot as the three things. So I asked Rob about what should I say about this business of Catholic education and the common good. He said, well, it'll come a great surprise to them if you start off by saying, you, you've thought about the question, the common good, does Catholic education have a role? And say that the answer is no, and thank everybody, and let them all go home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do that uh, at th that this evening on it. Um, instead, what I'm going to do is is take a paper that looks at the following. I'm, I'm going to say a few introductory comments, and then the paper is really divided into two sections. What sensibly can I say about the common good, after all? And then, in terms of the Catholic position, I'm going to I'm going to argue that, in fact, Catholic uh, education has a major role to play in the common good. And I'm going to make the argument on the grounds that it's designed to do that. It's got processes in place to do that. And there are outcomes that show that we, we do do that. I'm going to argue in the, fa in the final part of it, I'll give 10 recommendations that I think are worthy of some consideration. But you can let me know if, in fact, they are worthy of consideration. So that's the, that's the uh, nature of the paper. So the church is teaching on the common good, as I understand it has gone through a number of stages. So I'm going to say some things about the evolution of that, of that church teaching, 
which will have some reminders for some of you. I'm going to say what are the four principles about it, something of what seems to be the common definition of the common good, what's this thing called the transcendental dimension of the common good that moves us from the common good to the supreme good, to make that distinction, what's our duty to attain and develop it, and what kind of values and virtues are needed to sustain it. So that's why I'm going to say some things about the common good in that, uh, in that uh, element. So this part of the paper is there. So let me guide you through the years very quickly. You'll remember, perhaps, Pope Leo XIII on Rerum Novarum, uh, which is generally considered as the start of it. Maybe you don't know this, though. Did you know that Pope Leo XIII wrote an encyclical on the Manitoba schools question? That very close. That may come up in the question period. I always thought that was a wonderful thing. And a whole series of worldwide events to do. He wrote an actual encyclical on the Manitoba schools question in 1897. So we, ha we, ha we start out the social teaching with, with Pope Leo XIII. Through the years, Pius XI on the 50th, 40th anniversary and quadragesimo anno and much of the things that he did about social action. The great book uh, by Michel Gavreau on Quebec, on the Catholic roots of Quebec's quiet revolution, makes a lot of commentary about how good uh, this, pope, this pope was in terms of creating the social action committees that basically said the quiet revolution was an internal debate amongst Catholics. Um, Pius XII, did you know he made the cover of Time magazine? You can read that subscript, his work in Justice and Peace, but no encyclical on it, and I think you know some of the debates about there. Um, the much beloved Pope John the Twenty Third and his two great encyclicals on Mater and Magistra, and this is the 50th anniversary of Pachim and Terrace with the big defense of human rights and, and the church's stance on, on that side of it. We go to Vatican II, of course, and Gaudium et Spes in 1965 and Dignitatis Humani in 1965, as well as the critical parts on it. Uh, Paul VI, on, in terms of the social doctrine, the Populorum Progressio, which and its theme of development and that we should be pushing. Um, Pope John Paul II and three great encyclicals on, on, the, on the social questions, including the Centesimus Annus on the 100th anniversary for it. And of course, Benedict the uh, uh, 16th, uh, who did Caritas and Veritate, which was on the anniversary of Populorum Progressio and made the commentaries on it, which is a wonderful review of that material. And we have, of course, today's Pope. And if he's done anything, he's given a tone to the whole question of, of, of our responsibilities in social justice. There is no test here tonight on do you know the contents of all those encyclicals over that time. But it's helpful, I think, for us to see it in, in, in something of a historic span as it, as it goes through. The compendium on, of the church's doctrine on social teachings makes the point that there are four major principles behind the church's teaching on, on uh, social doctrine. The, the first and foundation of all of it is respect for the human person. The human person made in the image and likeness of God is where it all starts. And even as a young teacher, we were always dr drilled into that notion. You have to see each child as a, as, a, as a person in whom God dwells. Promotion of the common good is the second theme. Solidarity is the third one. And subsidiarity is the fourth one. As the four major principles behind the church's social doctrine. And the definition that's commonly associated with it, this is worth pondering about. The sum total of social conditions which allows people, either as individuals or groups, to reach their fulfillment more easily and, and fully. So the sum total of the social conditions, working towards the social conditions that allow individuals to flourish and groups to flourish as the basic thrust of, of what the common good is, is going to be about. Um, and further understandings, generally, it, it, common good in, in the church's eyes is more than the sum of the particular goods of each subject and that social entity. And it belongs to everyone and to each person. And it's, and it's an in, indivisible entity because only together is it possible to attain it, increase it, and safeguard its effectiveness. The application of the concept of the common good that no expression of social life from the family to intermediate social groups to associations Enterprises of an economic nature, the cities, the regions, the states, up to the community of peoples and nations can escape the issue of its own common good and the authentic reason for its existence. So the, the church makes a lot to do about how do you apply that concept 
and says that, of course, everybody has the right to enjoy the conditions of social life that are brought about by the quest for the common good. And then there's a transcendental dimension of it that says the common good has, it's as important as is the socioeconomic conditions and how good they all are and how important they are to people, that in Catholic thought that we have to go beyond that, that the personal and collective effort to elevate the human condition begins and ends in Jesus, that to him, by him, by means of in the light of every reality, including human society, can be brought to its supreme good, its fulfillment. So we think about the common good as, as not having just a temporal kind of dimension, but an eschatological dimension on it in, 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 our, in our teaching. And then, of course, it, the church switches over to the notion of duties and makes the argument that individuals and groups have duties to attain the common good, and the state itself has a, has a duty to harmonize the different sectoral interests with the requirements of justice. Now, I, I stop here for a moment to say, well, there's a lot of material, and we can talk for, for a long time on, on you know, this 115 years or so of the church's feeling on the common good, but where does it show up in perspective with other traditions? Well, you, I, you probably know the work of Michael Sandel at, at Harvard, and many people consider him to be the most popular professor in the world today in his, his course on justice. He has a new book out in the last year or so, which... Uh, called Justice, What's the Right Thing to Do, which, which uh, some of us have read and we were chatting a little bit about it, which I think personally is a wonderful piece of work on it. Uh, and he, it's, it's, a, it's a long book that, that looks at the various ethical traditions on it. I think it's the first time that I think I ever understood the notion of the categorical imperative uh, on it. Remember all that stuff? There's a chapter on Immanuel Kant. You remember that from your youth of having to read something about uh, the category? He contrasts it with the hypothetical imperative. And whoever thought of doing it that way, what a nice way to do it, you know. You've got a categorical imperative against that one. In Sandel's uh, view, um, you, you know, there's a lot of uh, work done, being done on utilitarian ethics and, and consequentialism. And we see that with a lot of the moral debates that are going on here now, that you decide if an, e if an act is ethical on the basis of what its consequences are going to be. Uh, a deontological ethics on the basis of is that, is that act right or wrong in itself? And let's take a look at, at an act that way. And thirdly, virtue ethics, going all the way back to Aristotle and coming through Thomas Aquinas about what virtues are necessary, what habits are constantly practiced if you're going to have a just society on it. And as I, as I was preparing this, this uh, address tonight, I, it seemed to me that that's where I wanted to go with it when I want to get it back into, into education. We have this notion of, of, of uh, the creation of the social conditions, and the social conditions are, are places in which people are going to be acting, and how exactly are they going to be acting? And we're trying to make an argument here, they should be acting virtuously. And so let me spin that out a little bit more. And that, how do, how do we think about the, the business of, let's say, a just society and acting towards the common good on it? Well, the church is very strong on the value of truth, which shows up all the time. But it, and, and of course, you know, as, as those of us who were probing the meanings today of the Catholic teaching on colleges and universities in a, in a document called uh, Ex Corde Ecclesia, or from the heart of the church, uh, universities are set up to search for, for truth. But it seems to me the old cardinal virtues of prudence, fortitude, temperance, and justice are all pretty well required as well, and particularly that, that virtue of justice in, in, a, in a society like ours. And because of the transcendental dimension and some of the teachings, particularly of, of Benedict the Sixteenth, the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity are, are required as well. So if we think about, about a, a just society that promotes the common good, the question that focuses in for me in some ways on it is what virtues ought to be illustrated or exemplified by those, by those people. Let me say a word about Benedict XVI just for a moment. I can't help resist but tell the story of my mother here at, at this point. My mom died about two years ago at the age of 97. And she was in her late 90s. And she was thrilled when, when Pope Benedict was elected as Pope, I should say. Because her words to me, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Say, keep reminding me if I'm too quiet, okay? So on the election of, my, of Benedict XVI as Pope, 
my mother told me how delighted she was for a couple of reasons. The first one was that she came in under Benedict XV and she's likely to go out under Benedict XVI. So she, she thought it was going to be a nice bracket for her house. And her, since her husband was named Benedict and she named one of our sons that way, she was absolutely thrilled with, with when Benedict was, was... But I always loved the thing about, I'm coming in under one pope with the name, I'm going out under, under the other one, and, and thought it that way. Well, Benedict wrote the one on, you know, when he wrote Caritas and Veritate, and he, and he stressed the notion that love is the underlying virtue that cuts across all of the things of the, of the just society. So in going after then the common good, we're talking about, I'm, I'm taking it from the point of view of what virtues are necessary, how do we go about the business of inculcating that broad range of, of virtues. Now, I'm going to take, before I go into education, I want to say a couple of other things. I, I was enormously impressed late, earlier this year with the Catholic bishops, the bishops of Quebec, and their, and their paper on uh, Catholics in a pluralist Quebec, which, which is a terrific paper, I think. The teachings out of Quebec. Now, those of us in education know that over the last 40 years, uh, uh, the Quebec has deconfessionalized much of its uh, health, education, and social services institutions. So you've got the bishops looking at it here, and they start with the theme of God loves this world, and he loves a pluralist Quebec, and that's the world we find ourselves in. That's what we're going to do. So they give some thoughts, first of all, about Quebec's new pluralism and the conditions of it. And then they go into the whole business of pluralism and religious freedom. But what I wanted to just say for a moment in reference to this talk is to say what they said about Catholics in a pluralist Quebec now. And making a couple of things. That The first thing that they wanted to emphasize was people have to make personal decisions that you want to live as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Christ is the foundation. So making that decision of living then as a, as a, as a person. Secondly was make reconnections to the parish. The parish for most Catholics who are practicing Catholics, the parish is going to be the center where a lot of things happen. And then the, the business about evangelization and joyfully sharing the faith. And underneath that joyfully sharing the faith, this is what the Quebec bishops said. And I, and I think this is a really profound stuff for all those of us in education here. So to be called to be Catholic today is to be called to come face to face with difference. Difference in faith, in religious practice or no practices, differences of conviction and opinion. But then in the face of that, our attitude must be one of welcome, openness, respect, and kind listening, sometimes in the face of mistrust and hostility. Um, and we have to manifest that attitude by determined involvement in ecumenical collaboration, interreligious dialogue, which are essential elements in the church's mission. Now, I think that's a very powerful statement. Uh, it resonates with me, at any rate, about how the, 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 the issue of coming face to face with difference. And we do it all. And, and to what extent, then, as we move into education, where we're trying to inculcate virtues, what opportunities are we going to give to, to our students to come face to face with difference in kinds of settings in which things can happen? Now, there are lots of people who work to create social conditions. If I go back to that definition of social conditions on it, and, and I want to range it from politicians to parents. You know, who, who does this stuff? And, and I'm trying to say what levels of common good are here. I was at a, at a, at a funeral earlier this week in which a young woman died. She was only 49. With my stand, that's pretty young. He said. And one, the theme that we heard over and over again was, geez, if you bungle the task of parenthood, nothing else much matters. You know, in, in terms of who and what makes for citizenship behavior. So, and then you will recognize the second one, the young uh, Trudeau, right? and the, uh, when, he, when he was a student at this famous school. Right? I, I was delighted to be in Montreal last week. It's always been a school I wanted to go see. That's Collège Brebeuf in, uh, in, in Montreal, the old, uh, old line Jesuit uh, school where Brebeuf went, and, or where Trudeau went and where he learned a lot of the stuff from the, from the Jesuits that he had there. And if you think about that, that, that admonition, go out and change the world, or go out and create the social conditions, I want to make the argument uh, here, uh, without any qualifiers in this case, that Trudeau, by going to that school, learned some of the attitudes that he learned about, maybe we ought to have a charter of rights and freedoms in Canada. 
Now, if you make a, an argument that says, right, if you think of Canada, you have to say that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms has changed Canada dramatically in the last 30 years. So here is a, a graduate of a Catholic school who clearly has affected society in very profound ways by changing the social conditions of our world in, in Canada. And so I, I want to say then that, that that's a, he, by very much promoting the common good and what the schools uh, would do. Okay, uh, now let me switch over then a bit to, to education. So I, I, what I've tried to argue up on, up on this point is that I'm relying very heavily on the church's uh, uh, theory of the, of the common good. And I've tried to buttress that with non-church teachings, particularly in the work of the most popular philosopher around these days of Michael Sandel. And I want to say that people are trying to create just societies uh, in which common good of individuals and, and groups can flourish. And I want to say that there's an inculcation of the virtues that we're trying to do with it. Well, how are we doing that about education? So I want to say this now about Catholic education in the second part of the paper. Uh, what's the scope of Canadian Catholic education in the first instance? Secondly, what's the design of it? What are some of the design principles about it? What are some of the processes that we use in Catholic education? And what are some of the outcomes of, of Catholic education? Now, we, we're not going to be able to go into all of those in all the great depth. So what I'm going to try to rely on here tonight is, is some pretty recent research on, on this kind of, uh, of material. But first of all, I want to raise this question again as to what we're doing on. So the common good, what's the right answer here? Does Catholic education have no role to play? Does it have a minor role to play? Does it have a major role to play? Does it have an exclusive role to play? As you think about, about the connection between Catholic education and the common good. Um, I heard an argument last week that the decisions in Quebec, by the way, you know, do, do many of you know the debate that's going on about that Loyola High School question? I, I talked to a friend of the court last week who had submitted the brief on it. And he made the, made the argument that what the court has ruled in that opening ruling is that basically there's a sense that Catholic education has no role to play in the, prom in the, in the, in the common good. And when I thought about this speech first, and I said, well, well Christina's given me a, a question. So I suppose I could play with a negative answer here and just say it doesn't have a role to play. And I'd probably rely very heavily on that debate that's going on in, in Quebec at the moment about the Loyola School. And that's coming before the Supreme Court of Canada next March or April, I, I think, on it. So minor role, major role, exclusive role to play. And you can think about that as we, as we go through. Now, the scope of Canadian Catholic education. So we've got in this country, we've got seminaries, we've got schools of theology, we've got colleges and universities, we've got schools, and we've got three kinds of Catholic schools in the country. We've got the constitutionally protected schools in Ontario, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. Uh, you might make the argument that we've got them in the Yukon and the territories, although they're not quite constitutionally protected. Then we've got publicly funded independent Catholic schools in BC and Manitoba. And then we've got Catholic schools down in Atlantic Canada, which get no money at all. So we've got a range of events uh, across the country. Um, and we had the big constitutional changes in the, in the 1990s, whereby Catholic education was pretty well decimated in Newfoundland and the big changes in Quebec, as you know. And then we've got tons of parish and diocesan programs, which in my view have to grow in the area of adult education. And we've got lots of retreat houses. You can probably add to them for that. I think they're all important agencies. But for my purposes here, I'm, I'm particularly interested in colleges and universities. I'm going to balance this more in the direction of the, of the schools. So on the design of Catholic education, if we do one thing in Catholic circles, right, is that we can write documents. Right? Now, I mean, we could spend the whole evening on taking all the documents on, on Catholic schools, uh, uh, you know, since, 19, since the Vatican Council when we did the, the decree on, on Christian education and take them for all the way up to the documents of 2009. I'm going to spare you that tonight. I'm not going to give you the same kind of overview as we did with the encyclicals on the social teaching. Uh, but there are, there are three statements that I think in purposes of of, uh, in, in support of the proposition. The proposition I'm making in this part of the paper is that Catholic schools, in principle, are designed to achieve the common good. So that's what I'm arguing in, the first, in this part of it. We're supposed to do that. Okay? And Archbishop Michael Miller, who's now in, in Vancouver, but used to be the 
secretary of the Congregation for Catholic Education in Rome, has a little book out called The Marks of the Catholic School. And fortunately, he summarized all the Catholic teaching for us in a very small little document. So you don't have to go and read through the whole of the, of the document to do that. Some of you have been very hard at work in what I think has been, you know, I, I have a high opinion of the work that the Institute of Catholic Education has done since its foundation. And I was around for part of that. But the work that was done on the expectations of the Ontario Catholic School graduate, I think it's, it's pretty important work. And then in colleges and universities, and we won't go into this much now uh, other than to say a word, brief word about it, but clearly the key document is Ex Corde Ecclesiae on, on of, uh, the Pope. So in, um, Archbishop Miller made the point that there are five marks of the Catholic school. It has an inspiration that's a supernatural one. It's founded on a Christian anthropology. It's animated by a communion and community. It's imbued with a Catholic worldview throughout the curriculum, and it's sustained by a gospel witness. Most of all, Christ is the teacher in Catholic schools. Now, we could unpack all of that, uh, all of those terms, because as always, Catholic terms are dense terms in, uh, in, in that. So it's getting a feeling for what those are meant, but maybe this is, uh, it, you'll, you'll take it on faith that part of that is promotion of the common good. And the expectations of the Catholic school graduate that we want, and as, as those of you who work on the document and know the document, is not only the seven, but there's probably 50, I suppose, subsections in there. So a discerning believer, an effective communicator, reflective thinker, self-directed lifelong learner. And then I think the three that are most directly applicable to this presentation about promotion of the common good would be ones that are related to work, family, and citizenship. So, Here's what we expect of Catholic school graduates then, that they are collaborative contributors who find meaning, dignity, and vocation in work which respects the rights of all and contributes to the common good. Is a caring family member who attends to family, school, parish, and the wider community, and is a responsible citizen who gives witness to Catholic social teaching by promoting peace, justice, and the sacredness. Of, well, you can't look at that and not come away with the proper with, without support for the proposition that we're designed in the Catholic schools to promote the common good of, of, uh, of uh, one. And of course, from Ex Corde Ecclesiae, we can go through a lot of this one, but the fourfold mission of the Catholic University in that there's, the first half of that document is about identity, the second half of it is about the mission, and the mission of how are you serving the church and society, what's your role in pastoral ministry, what's the role in the dialogue with the culture, and what's the role in evangelization. And so the board members, uh, the, the governors of this uh, institution spent the whole day thinking about how are all those things working out at St. Jerome's and, and what I, I thought was very laudable activities. And so I, I make the, the proposition on the same page. So based on an analysis of those three documents, it seems clear to me that Catholic education at the school and university level is intentionally designed to promote the dignity of the individual and the common good. So that's, that's proposition one under Catholic education. Proposition two is the processes of Catholic education. We all have experience of the procedures and processes used inside institutions of Catholic education to accomplish their objectives and mission. But what does the research say about it? We can all go to our memories uh, on what we have. I have this unique experience, I think, in, in my, you know, I never had a lay teacher until I got to college. Every teacher that I had in elementary school and in high school was either a, a, a sister or a brother, uh, religious. I never had my first lay teacher until I got to college. I grew up in small town Newfoundland. My parents, on the other hand, never had any religious teachers, uh, well, in terms of members of religious congregations. And my kids have had very few of them along the way in, in the modern era. So I think this period of growing up in the, in the 40s and 50s was, you know, and we, we could all spend all evening talking about what processes did you go through in, in Catholic education in, in schools. And I, I increasingly I've come to appreciate that there's, there was something really unique about my, my education and those of my, my, my confers. So we can talk a lot about research, but let me take the best research. Right? This was the big award-winning book, of, and it's a good year to, to comment on it. It's 20 years ago uh, on it. But it's the one on Catholic schools and the common good by Anthony Brake 
Valerie Lee and Peter B. Holland. This was a major uh, piece of research in, in, uh, in the States 20 years ago with its case studies of, of very successful Catholic secondary schools. What made them and, uh, and what, um, let me emphasize the word up there of the broad cross section of, of students. They took a look at Catholic schools, did detailed case studies on them in the 50s, went back to those same schools in the 80s and looked how they were, how they had evolved and particularly how their enrollment patterns had changed from, from being all Catholic kids to schools in which there were great mixtures across of all of them. And so when I, my first start on this paper, and in fact, Christina, you'll remember when you called me, this was, I said, geez, it's a good time to do this. this so the first time, my first draft of this uh, paper tonight was all rooted in this book, and I thought maybe I'd spend uh, more time on it. But Catholic schools and the common good was a very big report. So what did they have to say about it? Well, the partial answer for it as to why Catholic schools did so much good work across a whole broad spectrum of people of religious uh, backgrounds and of particularly of socioeconomic classes would, had to do with what they called the communal organization of the school. So there's, a, there's two full chapters devoted to this component of uniqueness of the Catholic school in its processes. So good Catholic schools do the following kinds of things. Three features that showed up in all the case studies. Number one is the extensive array of school activities that provide numerous opportunities for face-to-face -face interactions and shared experiences amongst adults and students. In the typical school, there are interactions, but nothing like the level of intensity that goes on in the good Catholic secondary school. The second one is the distinctive structural component that allows the community to function, and this is basically around the teachers, the individual teachers, and what they consider to be the extended scope of the teacher's role. Teachers are not simply classroom instructors. They are everywhere at all the activities and they're in, into uh, knowing all the kids across the school and, 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 um, and working together to make sure that it's a successful experience. But crucially, a set of shared beliefs about the school, we are a community uh, that respects the dignity of each person, has an ethos of caring about it. Those three characteristics show up in this, uh, in this uh, research by Breich and his, and his columns. And they, they focused in on that as probably the, the single most important dimension of the processes of Catholic schools. Catholic schools are very strong on, the, on, on those kinds of dimensions on it. So we have some partial answers about processes. And I invite you to say, when you, when you know about Catholic schools, what are the good processes? Uh, we lost this year one of the teacher who had the greatest influence on me, a brother Slattery uh, out, uh, out in Newfoundland. And I mean, this was a guy, I, I've been collecting data on this fellow across the country. Because as, as Christina said from my bio, you, you'll note that I've worked and taught in a lot of different provinces. And so did brother Slattery. And I can document stories that go from the East Coast to the West Coast of people that, uh, that have, have said about the incredible influence that he had on them. I asked Slats, everybody called him Slats. I asked Slats one time, what was his philosophy of all this stuff? And he said, basically, I'm helping people grow up, helping them become, become adults on it. And the stories go on and everywhere. And I have to tell you one small part of that. I was doing research down in Halifax a couple of years ago, and I was interviewing Archbishop Mancini. And he, in the course of the conversation, he said to me that he had gone to high school in Montreal. And after we had finished the interview and we were walking out, and I said, Curiously enough, what school did you go to in Montreal? And he said, Pius X. I said, and, and who taught you there? And he said, well, the guy that had the greatest influence on me, this chokes me up still thinking about it, was Brother Slattery. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I keep, he, he said the person who had the greatest influence on him was Brother Slattery. Now, I have to tell you, I can document that story from cases from the Kamloops to, to Vancouver, all the way out to Newfoundland of a person who really worked hard on, on the processes upside the, upside the, uh, the Catholics. So he died at the age of 87 in, uh, in, in March of this year. But now we come to the outcomes measure. So how are we now doing in these Catholic schools about it? And the best work of late is the Cardis study. The Cardis Education Survey of 2012 
And the question they posed, you, do you know Cardis? Cardis is the think tank uh, around, uh, around Canada, it does, does work in Canada and the United States. So this study from last year looked at this question. And we're, we're focusing outside the school and going back to people. How do graduates who are between the ages of 23 and 39 and who attended the following kinds of schools? They called six different schools in here. The separate Catholic schools of Canada, the independent Catholic schools of Canada, the independent non-religious schools of Canada, the upper Canada colleges, so to speak, private Christian schools, and homeschooling. And how do they compare to public school graduates on the following three dimensions? So they had three outcome measures. So we're going far beyond here now the stuff of the educational quality. What's that organization again, Mark? You were saying e EQUAO or EQAO, okay, on it. And so you got three major outcome variables in this study. What level of civic engagement are they involved in? What level of academic achievement do they have? And what's their interest or level of work in religious formation? That's what they tried to do. There are two reports out on it. One of them is all the data charts. There are two, I'm not giving, fortunately for you, I'm not sharing all the data with you. There are 200 charts in this uh, report. So we could be here all the rest of the evening. But I'll be selective about it. This is a $1.2 million study. This was not a small study. Right? They, they, uh, they raised the money to do it. And they had, first of all, the data were collected by uh, Angus Reed's uh, operation, the critical vision out of Vancouver. And then they turned the data over to the sociology department at Notre Dame in, in Indiana, the research director, Dr. David Sinek, uh, from, um, from down there. And so that's the study that they, they did. How are the graduates comparing uh, on it? That's what the paper looks like, and you'll be interested in the title of it, A Rising Tide Lifts All Boats, Measuring Non-Government School Effects in Service of the Canadian Public Good. So I'm going to say public good is the same as common good here, which is why I'm, I'm working it into, into the paper this evening. And here's how the distribution went of the responses they could use. So from public school graduates, there were 683. From separate Catholic graduates in Ontario, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, 368, independent Catholic 49, 23 of whom came from BC, the non-religious sector 112, Christian 110, homeschool religious, there are all kinds of homeschooling, they concentrated on, on the homeschooling that had a religious dimension, 34, uh, and you can see um, the, the asterisks over here. They do make an argument, there were uh, on it, that even expanding the sample, these are all randomly selected graduates, that their data wouldn't differ very much if they, if they probed it a little more. So that was the uh, survey. And here's the, there are lots of conclusions on it, but here's the big one about separate Catholic schools of that six categories. Separate Catholic schools for almost every measure, including religious, produce similar results to graduates of public schools. Let me say that again. That's on virtually every measure of the study. All the measures of achievement, uh, all the measures of uh, engagement with the different levels of the society, all the measures on, um, on an achievement, and all the stuff on religious formation or religious practice. There are virtually no differences between separate school, Catholic school graduates and public school graduates. There are some differences, but they, they make differences between, you know, is it statistically significant differences or are there slight trends? So there's some slight trend differences. And so here's some of the differences that are in there. Separate graduate school, th this first finding was such that they highlighted in the executive summary of the report. A lot of people are going to be delighted with this first finding. This is the one statistically significant finding of difference, that the graduates of Catholic schools who are the ages 23 to 39 have more confidence in organized labor and unions than any of the other uh, groups in there, which is kind of interesting. you know, if you. know, uh, some of my friends here are from OEC. If you go onto the OEC, the website is a very strong commitment to social justice and, and the organized labor that favor. So it looks to me like I could read into that to say, well, if you take that principle that you're trying to do that, clearly we're successful. You know, we're, we're on it. They tend to be involved more involved than the other groups in neighborhood and community associations and in arts and culture groups. Although that's not st statistically significant, it's a slight tendency on it. They're certainly not as involved in political life as much as the graduates of the, of the um, uh, in independent non-religious schools. 
They're more supportive of the view that the federal government should do more to solve social problems. They're slightly more likely to make difficult decisions with the help of the Bible, and they tend to marry at older ages on it. Uh, there's some demographic uh, material in here, too. To give a flavor of some of the charts, I'll give you four or five of the charts that come up. Um, the, they, um, this one, for example, is do you volunteer outside your religious congregation? You know, uh, as I say, there's, there's a, they, when they talk about the common good here, there are a whole range of activities. You know, are, are you involved in running a minor sports program too? Do you run for office? And all the, all the things that go in. So volunteer outside the uh, congregation uh, is, you've got um, the numbers on the side there. Uh, these are hard to tell. I, I should just point out this, this line. Let me just make sure I can. How do I do this again, tape? I want that arrow. That, uh, on this particular one. Does that give me the arrow? It doesn't give me the arrow. The, the pointer, all right, we're, all right. Okay, I'll, I'll just point it out. The zero baseline, this is, this is the line for the public school graduates, right? And everything else then is either above the line or below the line. That's how, that's how they presented the comparison. And the numbers on the side are the coefficients in the regression analysis. So this is the statistically stuff on. You almost got to get down into this level before it becomes statistically significant. If the numbers are in this part of the chart, there's virtually no difference, but there's slight tendencies on it. So on this one, on people that volunteer outside their congregation, you can see that separate Catholic uh, people tend to be less volunteering outside their congregation. Independent Catholic, slightly more. Independent non-religious, uh, slightly more. Christian, uh, a little bit more, and religious home education types, uh, hardly at all. They, 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 they do this way. Now, as I say, there are 200 of these charts, and you'll be happy that I'm not giving you all, but let me give you a flavor of them, though. God has called me to a particular line of work, a, voca a vocation sense. Right? The, you can see the baseline is, is down here. There's virtually no difference from graduates of Catholic schools, but the independent schools, same way. But the Christian schools, Graduates of Christian schools and the graduates of religious homeschooling are very strong on the proposition that uh, they're. The, the difference between the brown and the green lines are uh, they have to uh, just factor out the family. So in the regression analysis, the, the brown line is, uh, is unaided, if you want, by taking out. So the really important ones to look at are, are just the green lines by themselves. On, a, on another one, I have an obligation to participate in politics such as voting or supporting candidate or party. Well, again, you see the same thing, and you can see how the Catholics are, are different on this, on this one. The people that are really active are the graduates of the independent non-religion schools. It's the Christian ones on it there. Um, if you can see this, my school prepared me well for interacting with society and culture around me. Well, there's almost no difference in the provinces on on separate Catholic schools and independent Catholic schools, but look at those other ones. They, uh, they're very, they're, those are statistically significant data on the graduates of, of those schools. Total years of education, um, they're, uh, again, not a, there's slim, slightly different uh, parts about it. Uh, separate Catholic graduates on the education one, it's kind of bimodal distributions. If you go to get a first degree, you've got a very strong chance that you're going on to get graduate degrees. Catholics are equally likely not to go on as well on it uh, over there. My evaluation of high school quality are all pretty strong. They're all, uh, how, how strong were the uh, schools? So they're all, uh, uh, they tend in that direction, although not necessarily all statistically significant. And now some of the religion ones, the dominant culture in Canada is hostile to my moral and spiritual values. So you'll note that one, right? The folks who are in the Christian and religious homeschooling, they say it's very hostile. To my, to the world, the world culture is very hostile. The, the separate Catholic uh, ones are, we don't say that at all. Our graduates don't don't say that that the, the worldview is is hostile to us um, in in that sense uh, uh, there at all. Um, and I have an obligation to regularly practice spiritual disciplines such as prayer or reading scripture. And there's virtually no difference in the first categories on that side, but big differences in the, in the Christian 
and religious homeschooling. Let me go back to this one just for a moment. On that hostile one, what was, what's really clear from these two categories, the Christian folks and the religious homeschooling ones, they perceive the world to be hostile to them, but it doesn't stop them from volunteering. They volunteer very actively, and they're prepared to be engaged with, uh, with it. Um, um, okay, let me, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm getting out of time anyway. So let me go back just to this one a bit. So what I've argued on, on this side, and this is where you want to think about how, how you, so this is a major study on these three variables. And the major conclusion is that graduates of Catholic schools are not substantially, significantly different than graduates of other schools on the measures of engagement with their society, academic achievement, and religious formation and, and spiritual formation. Now, is that a good thing, bad thing? How to judge that? I talked to the folks at the, who were directing the project on it. And they said they didn't know how to interpret it either. They said it was interesting kind of data and ought to be data to be considered by it. But just on the civic engagement one, for example, if you think about that, if I think about the Manitoba mission, of ed Manitoba's mission of education is, is simply stated, we're preparing people for citizenship, for lifelong learning, and for um, the world of employment. Those three things. That's our mission statement, right? Every statement is we're preparing people for citizenship. And we do tons of stuff out there to make sure that you've got to do so many volunteer hours in order to. I had a, a student in classes. We wanted, I teach in the Faculty of Education at our place. I teach B ed courses, M ed courses, and PhD courses. So I've got this B ed course right now. And out in our part of the world, of course, we get a lot of students from Kenora, Fort Francis, and that sort of stuff. And this topic came up this week about some of the graduation requirements. And, and she was really quite eloquent about, there's a kid from a public school in Fort Francis, Ontario. And she was telling the class about the civic engagement that she had to do as part of getting that high school credit in the number of hours that she had to work. So there's lots and lots of people in the, in the public school. So should we expect any, any different on, on these things? It's the one that really surprised uh, the, the writers of this report was on the spiritual formation one. That there's, and, and then that, that, that's a question then that you want to probe a little more as to what does it mean in our, in our environment. There's also, of course, this data is for people who graduated, they're now 23 to 39. So when did they finish up the school? Was that before the Ontario Catholic School graduate expectations began to take effect? Or is it baseline? Or is it, I regard this as baseline data that, that's helpful for it. So in this part of the paper, what I've tried to do is to say, all right, Catholic education is designed to promote the common good. Processes inside Catholic education actually do uh, work well, as we know from the Bright study. And thirdly, there's a lot of data that says Catholic outcomes are pretty strong. There's a lot of data there that says, well, there's a lot of questions here as, as well. But, but this is fairly positive data in my, uh, my way of, of, uh, of looking at the, at the material. So s taking all that into effect, what kinds of recommendations do I, I make? So I, let me, I'm going to ride some hobby horses in this as well as the, as the data here. So let me take three. We've got the Bright data. We've got the data from the CARTA study. But we don't have a whole lot of data in Canada. So I, I believe strongly that somewhere in the country we need a center for research on, ca on Canadian Catholic education. There, there isn't one that needs to be established. What are, what are we going to do about that? that kind of stuff. Where are we going to get the data on, on how well we're, we're doing? We have, we have to collect data on outcomes of every imaginable kind in schools these days, but we don't synthesize it. We've got no place like the CARA uh, the center down at Georgetown. So that's one thing we need. We need more data about this stuff, and I think we need a center. Number two, we need efforts to appoint a Canada research chair at a, in, in Catholic education, that should be. Efforts be taken to appoint a Canada research chair in Catholic education at a Canadian university. Amazing, we've got all these Canada research chairs across the country, but we don't have, especially, in my opinion, it needs to be on Ontario. You know, and Ontario's were Catholic. Last time I tried to get real hard data on Catholic education in the country, I think I found that there are maybe about 650,000 kids in Catholic schools in Canada, and about 500,000 of them were here in Ontario. So Ontario is where the action's got to be, and so I think. Some place, you know, what, could be St. Jerome's maybe. maybe. Maybe what St. Jerome's needs 
is a Canada Research Chair in Catholic Education. I think there needs to be a Canadian Society for the Study of Catholic Education. I, this idea came to me when I was at the meetings of the CSSC, and a successful motion was put forward that we have a Canadian Society for the Study of Aboriginal Education. We've been around a lot, very long time in Catholic education, but we don't have a Canadian Society for the Study of Catholic. Now, I'm probably as much to blame for anybody around as that. All those years when I was very active in the Canadian associations and didn't do as much to promote that as I should have. I think we ought to take something like a step to convene a national forum on Canadian Catholic higher education. We had some stuff on, on a you know, forum on, on Catholic education, but I think a lot of work needs to be done on that number four. Um, this was an idea I floated before ACC. Doug and I had a lot of, a lot of uh, when I was on the executive of ACCUC, Doug was the president and I was the secretary. So I was always carrying out what he wanted me to do and those, on those kinds of uh, things. But an idea I floated with the group recently and, and with some of the bishops was we ought to plan for this. Because the question about, let me, I'll just say some of the reasons why I think about that number four for a moment as to where we're going. What are we doing with Catholic education in the community colleges? Right? The whole post-secondary sector. What are we doing in the graduate and professional schools? I mean, if you think about Catholic education, think, contrast it with the states if you want. We have no... Catholic faculty of education as such. We've got no Catholic faculty of law. We have no Catholic faculty of management. We've got no Catholic faculty of engineering. We've got on and no Catholic, Catholic faculty of social work. So where are we going with Canadian higher education? So my view on this was that we had a plan for something, set it up for two to three years ahead of time, get a uh, um, commission some people to do some papers and think tanks about it. And this leads me to the next one. I think that we ought to give some thought to the establishment of specialized centers of Catholic thought in a select number of Canadian universities. I was so pleased when I looked at your website and saw that you had the Master of Arts in, in Catholic thought. My, my notion on this is slightly different, perhaps, uh, on it. Because I'm, I'm thinking, OK, you, this idea came to me when I was living on the UBC campus a couple of years ago. I'm looking at this West Coast culture, and I'm saying, you know, you've got, you've got all of these dimensions of culture. Why don't we have a Catholic center that looks at, at the culture of, of the Asian countries, if you want, the, or some form of, of it? And so what it would, this, these centers would link Catholic thought to science. Or there, and you'd say, OK, let's see if we can't put together five nodes of them across the country and put them in, in different universities around there so we can, we can do work on them and, uh, and, and go through it there. I think both at the level of the schools and the colleges that there should be established identity and mission committees which focus attention on ways and means of promoting the common good amongst other things. I think every Catholic institution ought to probably have those. That significant resources be allocated to the recruitment and professional development of teachers, specialists, administrators, and governors committed to Catholic education. I think that's always uh, an important kind of thing. That opportunities be created in Catholic institutions to inculcate those virtues that we referred to before to promote the common good in a pluralist society. That Catholic schools and universities promote the concept of vocation among the members of the community and especially among students. This notion that comes out of the card is saying, let me say a little more about that for, for a moment though. Like I, in some ways I think we've lost the sense of vocation. We don't talk about it so much. And I heard an, an exposition on vocation the last couple of days that I thought was fabulous that said, Vocation, the concept of vocation has four parts to it. The first part of it is affirmation. So, it, you know, if it's, uh, if it's the archangel visiting Mary and where they say, blessed are you. So there's the, the notion of affirmation. The second part of vocation is the assignment. What are you going to be asked to do? The third part of it is equipping, setting up the people to accomplish that. And the fourth part of it is accompaniment. God accompanying people on it. Now, that makes a lot of sense to me about how do, you, how do you work on the notion of inculcation of a sense of vocation in the schools and for all of us as well. And so finally, I'd say that for all of us interested in Catholic education, you keep before the conviction that God loves us in the world and in response, we should, in the famous words of Micah the prophet, act justly, love tenderly, and walk humbly with our God. So conclusion, against that spectrum of does it have a minor role to play, no role to play, a major role to play, or an exclusive role to play? I said, well, you can't do an exclusive role, obviously. 
and I think you can't, you got to rule out um, um, a no rule. So I'm on the side of the ledger. I'm coming down hard tonight on the issue that I think Catholic education will continue to have a major role to play in promoting the common good. Thank you. Okay. Want to stay here? So Dr. Stapleton's agreed to take questions. Um, so we have a microphone on each side of the room. Please feel free to come forward. Um, maybe be as concise as you can so we can get in as many questions as possible. Okay? I'll let you handle them. Sure. Okay. about 680 public school students as a baseline. Yep. Uh, did that have an, a distribution of Christian and Catholic and perhaps not even non-Christian students with that? I would guess so. I would think that it would have a representation in the across all, you know, it's, these, are, these are Canadian kids that are, who are in Canadian public schools across the country. And so the answer, I think, would be yes. Uh, did they have any findings on Catholic or Christian students within public schools as opposed to the... No, they were... It was just a, it was an undifferentiated one on that concept. Yeah, so it's just in kids that were in the public schools. Okay? Thank you. Right, thank you. Now, I, see, I think, I happen to think, by the way, that, you know, Ontario is unique in many ways. But if you're in seven of the provinces, then I think uh, all those of us who are Catholic have particular interest in public schools. You know, I, I think we have to make sure that, that public schools are, are wonderful institutions. And so you, because most Catholic, most of the Catholic kids in all across the country, other than Ontario, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, are in public schools. So we have to have an interest in how public schools do, you know. So it's, it's very important to us, that one. Okay. Please. Has uh, anybody ever called you an evangelist? No, they've called me lots of things, but not an evangelist, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think. No, Thank I you. think what you have said, uh, I have to say, praise God, oh, it's you. very, very significant and important because um, my first, the Bible, and then I read the National Post. Right. And almost every day there's something about immigrants and refugees etc 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 and they all want to come to Canada where the good life is mm -hmm. I feel and you're the person to talk to and this is the group to bring it uh, up before them that somehow we have to move what you have just said um, the speeches, maybe the books or whatever, into these countries which doesn't have this, which instead uh, has uh, torture and uh, cut off the head and cut off the arm and the legs and so on and so on. How do we get the good news that you have told us this evening to the people over there? Because as a taxpayer, I'm running out of money. Thank you. Well, that's a, that's a big uh, comment, a big set of questions. I'll, I'll respond in maybe way, by way of stories. Uh, the first one on your story on the Bible, by the way. Let me uh, read the Bible, and I, I thank you for bringing that up. Last time I, I, I went seriously at the Bible, my wife and I went off to Tantur. Do you know the Tantur Ecumenical Institute? The, the one over, it's in the south end of Jerusalem. And, uh, Naively, at one stage, I, I said, well, I'd like to really get a degree in scripture. You know, I don't, I don't have the, the kind of background that you, that you do. I always kid people that I have this honorary degree, which was a great honor, with very limited work in, in theology, I should say. Anyway, we're at Tantur. Tantur is in the south end of Jerusalem. It's right as you go into Bethlehem. And it was set up by Paul VI after the, um, after the Second Vatican Council. He asked Notre Dame if they would... He was set up an ecumenical institute because he was so impressed with the ecumenical work that came out of the out of the uh, um, council, and so at the uh, uh, Notre Dame agreed, Father Hesburgh agreed, and so they set it up, and it's right there right now. It's at the separation fence. The fence cuts right across the property on the uh, part about. It. 
Anyway, we, my wife and I went for a three-month stay there to study it, and I figured on the, on the first um, week that what I would do, it's an opportunity to go, in, if you're you know, in, 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 a, in the biblical land, I would, I would start from Genesis and I would read the Chronicles. I'd do the whole thing at one fell swoop and, uh, and remind myself of what's in that, what's in that story. And we, uh, this was a group of 20 people and everybody was reading something. So we were at dinner and the guy that was next to me, as we all went around to say what we were reading, was a Jesuit who taught in a seminary in South Africa and was a scripture scholar. And he said, well, he was reading the Bible too. And he was reading exactly what I was reading, except, of course, he was reading it in the original Hebrew. You know? <laughs> so, so I felt like the class dummy there as well as some other things. I think the issue that you've raised, though, about, about um, doing work in other countries, uh, the work of the International Federation of Catholic Universities, I believe to be very important work. And the support that, that has been given to universities in parts of Africa, you know, uh, parts of South America, by, by IFCU as it's called, I think that's been tremendous work. Now, IFCU has been held twice in Canada um, over the years. Every three years they have a general assembly. In 1952, it was held at Laval, right? which is an interesting thing. Uh, in 1985, 84 maybe, it was held at St. Mike's. It hasn't been held at a Catholic university in Canada ever since. Uh, St. Jerome might be a wonderful spot to host one of the upcoming general assemblies at, uh, at it because it brings in to, to bear lots of what's going on in the, in the Catholic world on it. In terms of students on it, um, one of my doctoral students uh, did a thesis mm, three years ago, maybe, on Winnipeg in a public high school and how it was doing on the matter of integrating refugees from Africa. It was incredibly powerful. These were the lost boys of the Congo, and they were brought into uh, Winnipeg, and they were in the school, and she did it a case study of, of their experiences and analyzed the case study in light of the, for those who know them, the Bronfen Brenner ecological models of organizations and that. Very, very powerful study. And so strategies to come out about educating those folks when they come over here in that was, was one, but, but clearly more has got to be done. When I was doing some international work, one time I was in Tanzania we were there to, to see if we couldn't get a project going. And, and I, I, I was stunned by what I saw in Tanzania. And I tried very hard to get a 10-year grant from the federal government to set it up where we could do teacher education uh, for, that, for that country. Um, we, were, we were unsuccessful in that application about it. But there was another case where, where we would go there. I think the Canada record in international education on balance has been pretty good, but I think there's a big debate about it now. And it seems to me that debate takes the following dimensions, right? Do we see international students as a source of money for us? You know, we, we, we're bringing in lots of international students and, and we're going out and doing it. But there was, a, there was a time when the ethic was more in the notion of development. How do we help folks develop and go that way? And so there was a more altruistic, uh, aspect about it some time ago. So your question opens up lots of insights for me and thank you for raising it. Well, I, I think the, uh, in terms of the outcomes of the common good, I don't think there probably is. I think there's a kind of a consensus around what the definition of a common good is. I, you know, I, I like this notion that it's the social conditions that allow individuals and groups to flourish. I think there's a consensus around that. Is there a common understanding that we have reached that or what does a, what does a utopian society that has reached it look like? I don't think there's much of a consensus on that. Uh, in, in my view. You may think differently, though. It's a, it's a very good question. Hard, hardly a trite question, I would think. Okay. Ooh, you got
Um, okay, my question is around um, signs of the common good in, in today's society. And I'm really inspired by movements like Avaz and the Occupy movement. And I think they really brought and bring the, the notion of the common good. Um, but it's not kind of out, outwardly Catholic. I don't know if there's sort of Catholics involved. But I don't see sort of a Catholic, <laughs> like those movements being coming from the Catholic Church. But I don't know what, what you would think about that. Well, I, I think there's lots of stuff going on, you know, in terms of, um, of the uh, of, of movements towards um, volunteer work in terms of organizations. It, uh, the, they did some comparison of CARTA's data of Canada with CARTA's data in the U.S. And one of the things is that uh, there's far more volunteer stuff going on in Canada about it. So the question, though, about, let me say, if I say the Occupy movement, on the question of do we do a good job in terms of promoting advocacy groups, I think that's, a, that's an interesting one. Um, I think of that sometimes when I think about the Winnipeg's major strike, you know, of the, uh, of the labor strike of 1919. And you look to see where the Catholics, you know, whether you know, were the Orthodox, how involved were we with that? Because it was the time of the social gospel and that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. But it would seem that in many of those cases, it's the social gospel of the other churches that has been a, a real wellspring of, uh, of motivation for people. But you can and I can. I, we can think, of probably both of us, of lots of incidents whereby people are dedicated to charitable stuff. To, uh, I, the, the, the illustration I would give right now, for example, the, the Chipman family in, in Winnipeg is a, is a very prominent Catholic family. Um, Steve Chipman is um, the part of the family that runs the automotive empire for them. Mark is the guy that runs the Winnipeg Jets, and he could run for anything in, in our city at the moment. Um, but Steve and his wife, uh, every Sunday, they run the uh, drop-in food at the kitchen down at Immaculate Conception Parish. And so I think there's a lot of that. The data from CARTA seems to say that we don't, Catholics don't get very involved politically, but we get involved a lot with associations. You know? mm -hmm. And so we get involved from time to time in advocacy around extension from Catholic education or something if we, if we mm -hmm. have to. But on the social movements, I don't know, would you consider Canadian uh, development and peace to be uh, in that frame of work? Uh, or not yes. a, as an advocacy group, so we got material there. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, the, the limited data that I've, that I've looked at would seem to say, in the matter of advocacy, we're, we're not quite as strong as we are in terms of actually doing the work, in my view. Okay. Thank you. Obviously, very important and very big questions. Uh, uh, just a comment first about the um, extension issue. Um, I, I, I was involved in that a, a while, and in fact, the year after, I was the keynote speaker at the Ontario Association for Education Officials in Ontario, where the paper that I gave was coping with fulfilled dreams. This is back in '84, '85. Like, be careful what and you so, right, be careful exactly, what you wish that's for. Right, that's where I took the quote from, and I thought at that time in, in my in my paper for big audience in Toronto, I argued that it would take 10 years to implement it fully you know, to, to go that way. Um, there's no question that there's, there's a great demand for performance on, it, on, on performance outcomes. So that, that's true, and so you get, but there's also pretty, well, pretty strong demands for other things, too. Uh, I mean, you know, like my, own, my own professional work is in educational leadership. And if I can take a digression down that road for a moment, right? Educational administration as a field of study has been pretty big in Canada since the 1950s. And Ontario took a different approach than everybody else for a moment. We set up the first doctoral program at the University of Alberta, but Ontario was so big that it wasn't going to be able to do it that way, and this was before OISE was set up. So the response in Ontario was to set up principal certification. You know, that, that's where it came from in the 1956 uh, era on that way. 
And a big issue around school organization and school leadership, your predecessors, if you want, the question was, how do you run a big organization? You know, because schools were getting bigger. The literature is dramatically changed right now. And it says that the best school leaders are now in the business of promoting school improvement, they're in the business of promoting democratic communities, and they're in the business of promoting social justice. Those are the three themes. And you're getting, this, this has been somewhat frustrating for me, I should say, in trying to sell this idea a little bit. On, you know, when I'm not with Catholic educators, I'm with other kinds of educators. And the, uh, the big debates in the, in the US literature on this point is that to, to change schools and change educational leaders, we have to very much affect the three leverage points of the profession. The leverage points of the profession of educational leadership for all the people that are school leaders in that here are the business of the accreditation of the pro university programs. The second one is principal. Okay. John, I had a question yeah, sure. um, that had occurred to me um, yeah. a year or two ago. Right. We had the G8 conference right. in Toronto. We right. had a little bit of unrest, protest. A few years before that, we had a World Bank conference in Quebec. We had a lot of unrest and protest. We had a lot of Catholic students who were actively engaged from a social justice perspective, a common good perspective in those types of protests. And I couldn't help wondering what we had to do to get some Catholic students and graduates on the other side of the table where they could actually be influencing policy in the G8 right. or be influencing the World Bank so that we didn't need them on the outside so much protesting all the time, right. but have them actually at the seat right. where living wage and right. usury interest rates and discussions around that can occur with a formed, an informed, right. if you will, conscience. So what do we have to do as Catholic institutions to not just grow protesters, right. but to but also grow the influencers? Are, right. Well, I mean, one of the reasons why I put the Trudeau picture in the slides up there was to say precisely that. You know, uh, the, the business of, uh, you know, the, in the Jesuit education, go out and change the world, you know, is, is, is also to become active in, in the different positions of taking on leadership. I mean, I, I think the, the political world is in many ways an honorable, I think politics is an honorable profession. I think that, that we, we have to look up to the folks who run for office, be it federal, provincial, municipal, school board. I think people that are prepared to be in the public domain, trying to advocate for the right allocation decisions, the right regulatory decisions, all of that is very important. Um, to some extent, what the, what the school literature is about is people have to model that behavior. So, you know, to what extent is the, is the school a, a place? I mean, I love that bishops, the Quebec bishop statement, right? If I, were, if I were still running a school, I would be taking that statement and I would say, okay, I think that makes a lot of sense, that business of how do you, how do you deal with difference? I'd, I'd probably be setting up structural activities where, whereby that got to be a, a bigger thing, you know, for it. Um, over there. So I would, I, the data from CARTA says that separate school graduates are not active politically. Right? Um, so in, that's a question I think that at the school level or at the other levels, whatever level is there, we, it's something we talk about and say, is this a problem for us? What do we do about this? Is this a problem? Do the kids think it's a problem? You know? um, I mean, I mean, you've got one a friend of mine in Ontario is under the very sad situation now. This is Dr. Ben Levin. You know, the, you may have seen that. Um, I, I think, like you, I was I was shocked by those uh, uh, accusations that that came out. There's been no trial yet, of course, but 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 I've known Ben Levin a long time, and when I was at one of one of our parties at, at the cottage in, up in Victoria Beach this summer. A friend of mine who's a school teacher and taught him as a high school teacher, as a high school And this is an illustration of schools promoting political activity. Ben was, um, when he was in high school in Winnipeg, he organized all the high schools in the city. And there's, there's pictures of him as a high school student that this friend of mine who's a historian 
brought over to the house one night to show the to show the pictures of him. And the year that he finished high school, he ran for school board member in, in that board. So he was the elected trustee at the age of 19, running the um, running the running the schools on it. So there was the inculcation of the his wife, I should say is a graduate of the Catholic high school, of St. Boniface High School on there, and that's where they met in the, in the politics of the, of the city involvement of, of, the, of the laboratory, if you want, of doing it. So I, I think that's all to be encouraged. I mean, we certainly had a lot of that stuff over the, fun, you know, you can marshal it over these funding issues now, but thank you, Judy, for that. Thank you. Okay, I'll go sit down. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to invite forward Marion Thompson Howell. She's the chair of St. Charles University Board of Governors to formally thank our speaker. Thank you, Christina. Uh, John mentioned uh, earlier that he spent the day with the uh, members of the Board of Governors as we wrestled through what it means to be a governor of a Catholic university and we looked at our responsibilities under Ex Cordia. And uh, you know, a among the many things that were discussed during the day, of course, one of the things that we reflected on is what we hear at St. Jerome's and what as Catholic educators we do very well. And uh, we also talked about the danger of focusing only on what we do well leading to complacency and in fact not taking us any further. And so, it, you know, it, it was interesting because I think that as educators, there's a number of things that we do uh, as we go through the process of development. And of course, one of those things is that, that, that we question, we reflect on that. And I think that what is most necessary is that we go through a period where we experience discomfort because it's only through that discomfort that, that we force ourselves to come through another side. And so, John, tonight, uh, I started out feeling fairly good and quite complacent as we looked at how well we designed and the process that we did very well. And I knew that there was something coming where I would feel uncomfortable. And initially, as I listened to many of us in the room when we saw the data on outcomes, there was an audible response within the room as I think many of us thought, oh no, you know, we've dropped the ball. Uh, we have failed. We, have not, we are not as good as we thought. And yet, as the outstanding educator that you are, we needed to move through that period of discomfort that pebble in the shoe, and you led us to, you, I wrote down that very first question, you said, I have a number of recommendations, let me know if they are worthy of being recommendations. And in fact, as you introduced recommendation after recommendation after recommendation, it became very clear to me that A, we have not failed, and B, that's exactly where we need to go. And so, thank you very much, both on behalf of the board for uh, what you did for us today and as well for those in the room this evening for both raising questions, helping us reflect, and also leading us very effectively through that discomfort. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. So a couple of things to say before we finish up this evening. First of all, I want to remind you to sign up in the foyer if you want to receive latest information about this series but also and regular emails about upcoming speakers, but also to let us know if we can let you know about lots of other wonderful things that are taking place at St. Jerome's this coming year. Secondly, every year St. Jerome's University is very pleased to be able to present to you this provocative program of speakers. We're able to provide lectures to our community at no charge because of the generosity of so many partners and supporters. So if you would like to support the lectures, there are donation envelopes, some of them spread around the room on the chairs, but also in the foyer. And we thank you so much to all of those who give so generously to us. 
In case you missed it on the way in, there are a number of wonderful fairly traded products available for sale in the foyer by our Social Justice Committee. And finally, I hope we'll see you at our next lecture, which will be on Friday, October 25th. Dr. Martha Zeckmeister will be with us to deliver the 2013-2014 Teresa Dees Lecture entitled El Salvador, Passion for God and Compassion for the Other. Dr. Zeckmeister is a member of the Congregatio Jesus, and currently she is Professor of Systematic Theology at the Universidad Centroamericana Jose Simeon Canas in San Salvador, El Salvador. She'll be with us on October 25th to speak about what she thinks all of us can learn from El Salvador and its martyrs. Most especially, that we can learn that no one who seriously seeks God can seek God without struggling for a more just world. So I hope you'll be able to join us for this provocative reflection on the need to work for justice. I want to thank you again for coming this evening. Have a wonderful weekend, a safe trip home, and until next time, good night. <laughs>